Today we have with us Mr. Dan Fasulo, Managing Director of Research for Real Capital Analytics, online at rcanalytics.com. And leading the interview will be Mr. Peter Slough, Managing Director and Founder of Steelhead Capital. So Dan, thanks for uh, joining us today um, with uh, Real Capital Analytics. Do you want to give uh, a little summary pitch on what you guys are doing and your involvement in the market and what what uh, what kind of position you have as a as a company? Sure, uh, uh, Real Capital Analytics is a research and consulting firm. Uh, we're headquartered in New York, offices in San Jose, California, London. Uh, we have a guy over in uh, in Singapore. Um, our, our core business is, is tracking uh, the sale and recapitalization of every significant commercial uh, property um, now around the world. RCA is a global business. Uh, we were founded in 2000 by Bob White, a former uh, East Hill Secured broker. My background is Cushman & Wakefield. Um, and, you know, the mission uh, is and still remains uh, to provide um, real-time information to uh, parties uh, involved with real estate transactions um, and for or other interested parties who we need to understand uh, values uh, in our space um, and, and, and certainly capital flows. Um, so we have a, a little under a thousand clients there, um, uh, large uh, private equity firms, hedge funds, owners and operators of commercial properties, brokers, lenders, appraisers, uh, government regulators, um, and increasingly opportunistic uh, uh, debt uh, investors and CMBS players. Okay. And does your <coughs> data and research, um, how uh, current is it given uh, sort of the velocity of transactions? Is there a lag in what, you're, in what you report, or how does that kind of work? Well, well there is no stock ticker uh, for commercial property transactions. Uh, that said, we think we've uh, created the most sophisticated methodology in the industry to um, get real-time data uh, to our clients. Um, we use a, a variety of different methods, um, whether it's... Um, um, you know, using sophisticated technology to track everything in the public domain, um, whether it's going courthouse by courthouse to track all the deed transfer records, um, or whether it's getting information directly from the, the principals involved in, in many of the deals around the world. Great. Okay. Well, let's uh, kind of start at the top of the list. Um, can you give me a little bit of commentary on, uh, in, in the audience, a little commentary on historical interest rates over the last couple of years? And, maybe uh, a little crystal ball forecast on, on what you see happening in the next 12 to 24 months? Well, um, I can certainly tell you what happened. My for forecasts are notoriously wrong. <laughs> but, Understood. <laughs> uh, but that said, uh, most of uh, uh, our economists' forecasts over the past uh, 10 years have been wrong. Um, uh, you know, we, we due to a lot of reasons, we've... Uh, been the beneficiaries in commercial real estate of a low interest rate environment. Um, you know, the 10 years pushing all year, all time lows. Um, I think a couple months ago we fell below 1.5%, um, which obviously is going to influence um, uh, mortgage rates. And, um, and for an investor looking at a commercial property, um, and even for a lender, I mean, uh, the spread between kind of average cap rates or or, or uh, uh, mortgage rates and, and the 10-year is at a 10-year a, a high. Um, you know, we're looking at 400 to 500 basis points uh, or better for certain property sectors. And it, it, it certainly created an, an environment where real estate, especially commercial real estate, looks awfully attractive uh, versus some of the alternative in investment classes out there. Um, We've, you know, we have many um, clients, investor clients who, and lender clients who um, kind of struggle with where interest rates are going as part of their analysis. Um, I think it's an easy bet to say they're going to go up over time. 
uh, and back to more normalized levels. You know, the Federal Reserve uh, has announced its intentions to try to keep um, uh, the low rate environment uh, in, in place uh, until at least 2014. Um, but, uh, you know, the wild card is, is the economic recovery. And um, if, it, if it really does pick up steam, um, you know, we could get in an environment where, um, you know, it's, interest rates are going to come up uh, um, maybe faster than, than anyone thinks. Uh, but the flip side of that is if the, econ the economy is recovering, that means NOIs are improving too, right? Sure. And what do you see now that we are uh, deeply immersed in a global economy? Uh, it's one thing to talk about the U.S. recovery, but what factors loom out there from uh, Europe or otherwise that uh, could have an impact on, on our interest rates here in, here in the U.S.? Well, in, in my mind, I mean, there is a direct relationship between, you know, the possibility of the, the Europe blowing up and, um, you know, conditions uh, or debt costs um, in, in the United States. You know, every time, you know, someone says something stupid in Europe, it seems like, uh, um, you know, spreads blow out and the, the CMBS guys are on the sidelines for a couple of weeks. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that said, it, it, you know, just just this week, um, you know, Draghi and the ECB announced that they're going to be um, a, a little more liberal as far as bond purchase, per, uh, the purchasing of bonds uh, for some of the countries that are struggling in Europe, which has certainly uh, settled down the, the markets a little bit over there. Um, and, you know, just today was an article in the Times about the euro rallying, the, pro the value of the euro rally rallying, um, and, you know, uh, just yesterday, the, you know, many of the stock markets hit, you know, multi-year highs, which is um, all a positive sign going forward in my mind. But uh, Europe and the contagion uh, from a potential uh, blow-up is, is my number one kind of global fear right now. Okay. Well, the next question is kind of a two-part question, which, which feeds off of that response. And uh, the first part of it is... Um, my understanding from what I've heard and read and, and experiencing, there is just a glut of maturing debt coming due. And does it, uh, does it have a home yet, or what do you see in the capital markets in terms of solving a, a lot of this maturing CMBS debt that, uh, frankly, the, the property values could be well underwater? Yeah. Um, you know, the, the big numbers, the big maturities start in uh, 14, 15, 16, 17. Um, that's when we get closer to... Um, uh, a trillion dollars a year, if my math is right. Um, I, I'm not as worried as most. Um, I think the capital markets uh, have the uncanny ability of, uh, uh, of fixing themselves. Um, I, I think over the next couple of years, uh, there's certainly a man manageable amount of, of maturities for the market to digest. Now, obviously, if you're uh, an owner and you're underwater, uh, that doesn't make you feel that good, right? You're still struggling. Um, and uh, the biggest problem my, for many of these assets is that equity gap that's going to be needed to, to refinance. Um, but, but that said, you know, the major quantity of these assets that are going to need to be refinanced on a dollar value basis are in all those major markets where we've seen uh, a significant re recovery in values. You know, you can argue in certain markets we've seen almost a full recovery in values from the height of the market. Um, now, uh, while L the LTVs available out in the industry might be lower than they were a few years ago, uh, that creating the equity gap, the fact that values have recovered so much means there is a plethora of options available for owners and lenders to, to restructure these um, uh, assets without, you know, basically facing the doomsday scenario. Okay. Uh, so I'm a little more bullish than most. Um, and if anything, these restructurings behind the scenes, which has been kind of the common format, have actually created a dearth of supply 
you know, that I, if anything, I get uh, more calls every week from our investor clients who are frustrated that there's no nothing to buy. You know, some of those opportunities that everyone thought that were going to come a few years ago just haven't materialized in a, uh, a holistic way. Okay. Well, my sense is that the uh, the larger institutional transactions, it seems like the uh, capital markets uh, more readily and more efficiently accommodate those scenarios. Uh, but I'm wondering for the small and mid-sized investor what they're up against as these loans mature and and uh, and I still am not seeing a ton of debt capital uh, for the small smaller to mid-sized transactions. Can you comment on that? No, I I think you're absolutely right, and you definitely need to differentiate between kind of the institutional marketplace and your more localized um, uh, uh, real estate markets. There's no question that values have not recovered um, in some cases at all in certain segments of the market, uh, especially you know smaller a assets that uh, may not have uh, the best credit um, and are in that kind of smaller loan size pool that you know the institutions uh, are not really uh, pushing into. Um, in my mind, that segment. Uh, of the market is more directly linked to the overall health of the economy, mm -hmm. and, and and that's what I'm going to follow um, um, to um, you know figure out if this is it's really going to be a a, a bloodbath bloodbath type of scenario in a, in a couple of years. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you're right. Your your trophy asset in New York or California is being influenced by a whole variety of kind of factors, global capital flows, you know, our government printing money that, um, you know, unfortunately, it's not really filtering down to everyone. Yeah, well, at Steelhead Capital, you know, we see, we think we see a, a lot of op opportunity help addressing these small and mid-sized players um, because I think the institutional firms are, are well capitalized with a lot of cash and do have financing options, and so we've got our work cut out for us, but you know, we're not sure yet where uh, where the majority of the players are going to show up on the debt side. It seems to me that traditional banks are still very leery and uh, very cautious, and uh, typically that's the small to mid-sized investor. Um, multifamily aside, which has remained liquid uh, throughout this downturn, but the rest of the asset classes, it seems like there's going to be some work to do to try and find a home for these these loans as they mature. You know, I was I was just on uh, on that point. I was just on the phone with a uh, a lender this morning, uh, a Midwest based lender, um, and you know they think multifamily has gotten very expensive. Yeah. Um, and they're thinking about shifting s some of their capital to some of the other property sectors, um, which you know um, uh, may not be as kind of top line healthy, but. Uh, certainly, in their mind, offer a better risk-adjusted return. And this is a, you know, lender that's doing, you know, five million dollar loans in the Midwest. Right. And who do you think is going to step up to fill that role? Is it going to be CMBS that wakes up again and figures it out, or is it going to be tr traditional banks? Uh, I wouldn't put life companies in that category because they've always been uh, historically conservative in their approach. But do you see anybody that uh, might fill that uh, void? Well, um, CMBS was a, a prolific provider of, of capital to that uh, segment of the market uh, back in the heyday. Um, you know, I, I think CMBS will come back. I've actually been unbelievably surprised with the resiliency of CMBS, considering sure. everything that's going on in the capital markets, you know, the volatility there, the volatility out of Washington with uh, – the, the regulation ping pong that's going back and forth between, you know, Washington and the, and the industry. Um, I think if, you know, some of these major external um, uh, factors calm down a little bit, if we get some stability out of D.C., I really do think you could see um, an explosion in the CMBS space again. Um, of the CMBS 2.0 or 3.0, bonds that have been issued recently, there's been significant demand among the bond investors, okay. uh, which, which 
is a positive sign for me that there is demand for that paper. Um, it just there hasn't been uh, enough volume uh, created yet uh, to really filter down throughout the entire country. Okay. So, and, and speaking politically, you know, with the upcoming election, is there a bias uh, within the capital markets as to who's betting on which candidate, whether it's Obama or, or Romney, which one will lead us out of this in terms of uh, viability? I mean, uh, it's pretty easy to figure out who Wall Street's supporting in this uh, in, in this cycle. Um, I, I think what the capital market is looking for is stability um, and clarity regarding regulations um, and, and for Europe to get their act together and you know, for, you know, uh, we're facing our own uh, fiscal cliff come December again, which could be a disaster. Um, so uncertainty is the, the bigger issue for me, not, not who, who's in the, the White House. I, uh, I, I think we just really need to, to make a long-term commitment to a whole kind of conduit platform for CMBS. You need to know what the rule is going to be in a few years' time. Right, and that's been the problem is that it's been so vague and so nebulous that uh, yeah. nobody can kind of plan against something that's not even uh, formulated yet. That's correct. Um, I, I, I will note that the regional banks have come roaring back um, in the Northeast and on the West Coast okay. um, and uh, have now captured a significant uh, percentage of the overall lending market. Um, so... You know, at, at some point, um, I, I think that trend will spread around the country as well. Okay. Can you uh, give a little insight as to uh, asset classes? We know multis have performed the best throughout the economic meltdown, but can you provide some color on other asset classes uh, that have either performed or not performed or recovering more quickly than, than the rest? Uh, sure. Um, uh, as you said, multifamily has been the clear standout for, for a variety of reasons. Um, after that, um, central business district, office, and retail, um, not for every market, but for m more of the major markets, has been um, uh, an outperforming in this cycle. Um, as expected, the, the sectors that have lagged are the ones that are most directly linked to the the health of the overall economy. Um, I'm thinking retail and industrial. Um, you know, overall consumer spending is still not back to where it was, um, and obviously it's, it's the retailers um, uh, that are really pushing or were pushing demand for industrial space. Um, you know, that said, there's segments in every property sector that are outperforming. Um, and, you know, industrial in California is very hot. Um, you know, there's tremendous changes going on in the retail sector right now and how retail space is used. And if you happen to be in one of those um, segments that is kind of part of this new, um, new world order, you're doing pretty well right now. Um, anything that has um, long term leases in place um, with what the market considers is, is, is credit tenancy um, has also um, done very well over the past couple of years. Yeah, I was surprised. To, uh, I, I recently watched a video, uh, interview video with uh, Barry Sternlich from Starwood Capital on Bloomberg, and uh, his sentiment on retail was that the prior sentiment of uh, death of the mall people were going online to shop versus uh, showing up and, and touching the bricks and mortar has actually uh, uh, transformed or, or swayed back to the sentiment that people, it, it's still a social experiment, or excuse me, a social experience, and uh, the online retail market will eventually get taxed and level the playing field between bricks and mortar. Uh, do, you, do you agree with that sentiment that uh, retail is a social experience and, and will survive sort of the, the online competition that's out there for that very reason? Yeah, you know, when, when Barry's buying what he considers are, are, are nice assets at 150 bucks a foot, you know, like a 
twenty percent of replacement costs, he's going to be happy and he's going to tell his story, right? Uh, it's hard to lose money when you're buying something at you know pennies of replacement cost. Um, I, I I happen to think that in the future for retail, I agree with what you said. It is a social experience, and some of the malls that have reinvented themselves into more lifestyle type of formats have done really well. Yeah. Uh, especially some of the ones that have integrated, you know, mixed uses like uh, residential and, and office. What I see happening over the next uh, couple of decades, um, and this is somewhat related to the, the urban retail play, is that retailers are going to have less physical locations but will increasingly be willing to pay more and more for the best locations. Okay. It's kind of the, the Apple showroom type of, type of experience. Sure. Where, you, you, know, you know, half the people that go into an, an Apple store, they play with all the stuff and they go home and they buy, they buy everything on the computer at home. Um, so that, uh, at some point, retailers are going to, not that they, they won't care, they're going to stop looking solely at sales per square foot, and they're going to start also looking at kind of the marketing slash advertising impact of being in a certain location. You know, so there are, there is big smart money basically paying anything for what they believe are kind of fortress locations right now around the world. Okay. Well, along a similar vein with Office, uh, it was once thought that uh, Office Space was going to find itself in trouble because of the, you know, the advent of technology and telecommuting and the, and the lower need, perhaps, for physical space for workers to come in. Uh, have you seen any trends that support that or, or counter that? Well, I mean, some of that's happening, or, or I don't believe in those macro trends. I think... Um, um, employees are always going to need to come together and if, if we know anything about some of the most successful companies out there right now, they're, they're putting uh, all their best people together in the same environment, in a creative environment, and it's creating a tremendous amount of, uh, of value. Um, so just through the fact that buildings are getting more and more efficient, space planning is getting efficient, I think you'll continue to see the average square foot per employee get reduced over time. That's the trend that's been in place for over 10 years now. That will continue. Um, but, I mean, the more major trend that I see is um, uh, companies increasingly preferring um, environments um, where their employees want to live and work. Um, it's the, you know, talent is, is the new machinery in the 21st century and um, uh, employ, uh, comp corporations are increasingly understanding the value uh, of, of having um, their offices in the right location and are, and are willing to pay for that. Okay. And let's just touch on hospitality because my view uh, from what I've seen, hotels have uh, picked up speed quite a bit. While some have certainly gotten in trouble, and and largely due to the fact of um, uh, over leveraging in the height of the market, but in general, it seems that hospitality is on an uptick, and uh, business travelers are are out there and and moving around, and uh, recreational vacation travel as well is is supporting that market segment. Do you agree? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're definitely seeing that same kind of bifurcation in the hotel space, where you know your trophy assets in the right locations or, or, or have seen their values, you know, escalate almost back to, you know, 2007 levels. Um, I, I think it's fair to say that um, uh, the limited service sector has stabilized, um, and in certain places, um, even in the Sun Belt, we've seen values recover slightly. Um, you know, I think of, of Texas, uh, you know, you have some special pockets. Um, uh, in, in Appalachia and North Dakota and uh, where the limited service sector is really hot actually because of uh, some um, uh, job growth in certain locations. 
Um, but overall, uh, again, I, I think the hotel sector's uh, fate is going to be linked to the, the health of the overall economy, right. uh, especially your bread and butter kind of uh, limited service hotel. Okay. Well, let's shift gears a little bit back to uh, agency business. Um, you know, Freddie Mac has adopted a securitization approach to bundling their apartment loans, uh, which wasn't the case in the past. Uh, but I recently read that uh, Fannie and Freddie are, are posting record-breaking profits, and I'm wondering how that's happening in light of the fact uh, of all the home loans that they they needed to absorb or uh, or digest. Because uh, to me, the apartment market obviously has uh, been hugely profitable for them, but as overall organizations and sort of uncertain uh, future prospects for their their structure going forward. Uh, how is it that they're posting such large profits given all the, the losses they incurred? That is a good question that I, I don't have a good answer for. I don't know the internal workings uh, of, of Freddie and Fannie. I mean, my specialty is on the commercial side, so I would know the, 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 the apartment side of that, which I know has been uh, very profitable uh, for both the, those GSEs. Um, if anything, that's why a bunch of you know, real estate industry groups are, are, are trying to get the regulators to basically segment the commercial property divisions out of kind of the, the mess on the residential side. Um, there's a lot of wild cards uh, in my mind on what's going to happen to both those agencies. Um, I do think, and certainly that's going to be linked to which administration's in power as well, I certainly do think that um, over time their size will be reduced, um, and maybe the, the segment of the market they serve might change a little bit, but I, I find it hard to believe that they won't exist in five or ten years. I think they will uh, figure out a way to uh, uh, remain a part of the, uh, the, the, the financing equation for residential property in the U.S., well, and there's been some speculation that they will privatize, and uh, because there is such a, a market there that that's ready to receive, uh, rather than than act as a GSC. What about HUD? Is uh, HUD automatically lumped into the same category in terms of its future? Or do you have any insights on what's going on with uh, HUD financing? Um, I, to be honest, it, that's not my world at all. Okay. Uh, I don't really get into that stuff. Yeah, I'm sure it's going to be largely uh, driven by whoever's elected in the in their agendas. Yes. All right. Have you seen a, uh, a shift in overseas uh, funds participating in U.S. commercial real estate investments? Um, a absolutely. Um, nationwide, uh, foreign investors made up uh, more than 10% of overall uh, acquisitions. Um, that's the m a multi-year high, the most we've seen in a decade. Um, okay. Yes. I was going to ask historically yeah. how that's how that's uh, relative. Yeah, over the last few years, um, they were about five or six percent nationwide. Okay. Um, so it does make a, uh, it does move the dial a little bit, especially um, where they're the most active, um, which is in the major markets um, uh, on the coasts. Um, I'd probably include Chicago in that group as well. Um, but increasingly, we've seen them in, involved in more platform type deals. You know, some of the larger portfolio transactions. Um, you know, the Kuwaitis have been, been involved in multifamily portfolios. Um, so it's a great source of capital um, uh, for the, the property industry. Um, and if our rules weren't so antiquated with FERPTA, I, I think we'd see even more. Uh, from, okay. from foreign capital. You know, that goes back to that, that conversation on the, the spread uh, to the 10-year. You know, you can get your best spreads in the world here in, in the U.S. right now. Got it. And what about the, uh, along those lines as well, uh, what about the REITs? It, it feels like um, as the larger deals trade, uh, the REITs are, are going downstream to smaller transactions perhaps. Do you see the the small, mid-sized players eventually getting squeezed out of owning commercial real estate? Yeah, I mean, well, well things have gotten expensive, uh, yeah. especially in the major markets where the REITs are active. Um, so they're, ha they're having to get a little more creative. 
you know, it's tough because they have to pass through all their income. It's tough for them to buy at a three or four cap, right? right. Um, so they are looking at um, different types of deals. You know, New York REITs have been very active kind of uh, behind the scenes in the distress uh, sector. Um, others are looking at development for the first time, especially the multifamily REITs. Um, and, you know, they're doing what they do. They're using their balance sheets to get creative and, um, you know, basically uh, generate yields that are uh, acceptable uh, for their, their platform. Right. Okay. Well, if you're, uh, if you're Steelhead Capital, uh, which we kind of touched on this, uh, you know, where do you see the opportunity to play a role? going forward? I, you know, there is just due to the, the amount of, of, of loans upon assets uh, between 04 and 07, there's going to be a tremendous amount of properties that are going to be facing a capital event in the next few years. Um, and it's certainly going to create a tremendous amount of opportunities. Uh, for your team and others to, to get involved. Yeah, that's what we see as well. So we're hoping we're right. Okay, well, that's all I have on my list today. I, I certainly appreciate your time. Uh, it's a privilege to talk to somebody who's, you know, right in the middle of it, so to speak. And um, I can't thank you enough for uh, spending time with us. My pleasure. Thank you, Dan and Peter. This has been a very timely discussion of commercial real estate trends. If you're an investor looking to finance commercial real estate, be sure to check out steelheadcapital.com and submit your no-obligation loan request today. 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 Today.